Hello, I'm Emma Louise Coffey, and you're welcome to the Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights, and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. On this week's episode, Department Superintendent Vet Inspector Philip Breslin quantifies the level of TB currently circulating in the cattle herd in Ireland and identifies the conditions that lead to herds and geographic areas being at risk. Currently, we have uh, 2,796 herds down in the last 12 months uh, with TB. And that uh, is similar to last year's figure of 2829. So uh, the, the, the picture for 2021 is that the herd incidence and the number of herds affected will probably be less than 2020, but more than 2019. As you might be aware that we have had increasing incidence of TB um, from about 2015, and it looks as if that will have peaked in the calendar year of 2020, and it is slightly reducing now. We had 4.32% last year for 2020, and at the moment we're running around 4.2%, a few uh, points under that and a few points over that in, in the last um, few months. So the number of animals then, we'll have about, we have about 21,000 for the 12 months rolling, um, as of a year ago, and it's pretty pretty much the same at 21470 at the moment again. So that's the current situation of disease in the country, Emma Louise. What proportion of these animals are dairy specific animals? Okay, well, as a proportion of the herds affected, uh, and if we go back again to, I suppose, the, the dairy expansion, which happened in the middle of the, began to happen in the middle of the last decade, and our increased um, incidence over the last number of years. There were about 45.5% of herds were dairy herds back in 2015. Now that's at uh, 56.5% year to date in 2021, up from 55% last year. So it's been moving up by about two percentage points every year. Now the, the proportion of dairy herds within the overall herds in the country is not moving up at that level. So the the TB disease situation is shifting more into the dairy side every year. And why, Philip? Well, you could say it's uh, it's because um, we know that we know that there's a a higher risk for TB in dairy herds. And this has been demonstrated in many studies over the years. But Recent studies are sort of beginning to to separate this out into more a risk being associated with large herds and dairy herds are larger dairy herds far more intensively so they've more animals on per per acre or per hectare. Um, They also have a larger footprint in terms of the amount of land that dairy herds are using so. Uh, The bottom line is that dairy herds are becoming riskier for TB because of those issues as dairy herds get larger with dairy expansion. Is there a similar level of TB across the country or would you see clusters across various regions within Ireland? No, Emma Louise, it, it, it's not uh, equally distributed throughout the country. There are hotspots uh, in many regions o- over the country. Um, so, you know, you have the, the Monaghan, Cavan, um, northwest Mead area. So there's a lot of TB there. Um, you get there's a lot of there was a lot of TB in the burn, but that is is rapidly improving in in recent months, and that's down to great cooperation there between the department and farmers over the last couple of years. Um, there are also um, hot spots are in 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 East Cork, in North Cork, around the Drum Colliher area in Limerick. Uh, there are a couple of spots in North Tip and South Tip and up around Tum as well. So they're around Horseleap uh, uh, in the Westmead Offaly area. So they're sort of the areas where we have hot spots for TB. And in many of those areas, we have hit plans uh, in action. So uh, these hit plans are high incidence TB plans. So uh, we have hit TB plans in a, lo- in a lot of those areas. So with those plans we apply extra measures in terms of extra testing we really focus uh, with the locals on trying to find uh, badger sets and we've an information campaign around the risks as well that pertain to 
TB being particularly high in those areas. Can you give us some detail on the testing methods that are used to detect TB within herds and whether the testing differs in these hotspots? Okay, so a lot of the extra testing that's been being done is extra testing based on the skin test. But we are also using the, the gamma interferon test as we do throughout the country, but we're using it in those hotspots as well. With regard to the TB test, the skin test, it's been around for a long time. It's still the best test recognized internationally as a surveillance tool for finding out uh, which animals and which herds have TB. Um, but it has its limitations, as do all tests across all diseases. So if you had a pen there of um, 10 animals that we know are genuinely infected, um, the skin test at any one effort at using it is will identify only eight out of 10 of those. Now, if you used it repeatedly in those 10 animals, it could it probably would identify all 10. So that's called the sensitivity of the test. So we'll often get these um false negative animals they're animals that are genuinely infected but the skin test will leave some of those behind now what we do about that is we use the gamma interferon test one of the blood tests we have uh, in infected cohorts where we have tb breakdowns and we use it in um the group of animals where the reactors were found uh, to identify extra animals because that will identify nine out of those ten infected animals in that pen. So it's better at identifying animals that are genuinely infected. Now, you might ask Emma Louise, so if it's a better test, why don't we use it as the screening test rather than having to put in animals on two separate days and inject this little bit of, of protein into the skin for the skin test? Well, that's because the gamma interferon test, the blood test, will misidentify animals that are clear as having TB. And it'll do that at a rate of about three or four in every hundred animals. So that's why you can't use it as a screening test. But when you know you have TB, it's a really good test. Now, going back to the skin test again, you'd only get false positives at a rate of less than one in 5,000. So less than one in 5,000 clear animals that do not have TB will actually become reactors. And that's why we have the singleton protocol in our scheme to try to deal with those animals that may be reacting falsely to the skin test. But the problem in our scheme, in our diagnostics, are the biggest issue rather than the problem because we do address it with the other tools we use. The, the issue is not identifying animals that have TB. The issue isn't misidentifying clear animals. Looking to a scenario where a farmer has consistently had no TB TB detected in their herds and now they find themselves in the scenario where they have a positive case or multiple positive cases what are the next steps right so if you have um if you have uh, one to 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 five reactors in your in your skin test well then you'll just go through the the normal procedure which will be you'll be restricted so you can't purchase in or sell animals unless uh, uh, unless you have a specific permit to do that. Well, you can always sell animals directly to slaughter. Um, you will then have to have the reactors um, examined by the veterinary inspector, which takes place in the in the few days following that. And those animals will those reactors will also be tested as part of a quality control um, um, system that we have in the scheme. The veterinary inspector then will do what we call the epi visit. So they'll do an epidemiological assessment of where the TB has come from in the herd. So I'll come back to that uh, in a little while. Um, then within about a fortnight, the reactors will have been valued and they will be removed. And there's good news on that front in terms of on agfood.ie now, the animal health computer system, uh, is able to um, take acceptance of valuations. So the acceptance of valuation um, uh, triggers the removal of the reactors. And then you're going to have to have a reactor retest, a skin test, 60 days from when those reactors have gone. And if that's clear, another one 60 days later, that again, if clear, will result in you being de-restricted. So two clear tests at 60-day intervals results in de-restriction. 
but you're then on a higher risk testing program unless you just have the uh, one case or you're a fattening herd you're on a higher risk testing program for a period of time after you're de-restricted now with regard to the herds that have uh, more than five reactors so at this stage now this these herds have a group uh, have a have a group of animals within the herd you know in a dairy herd that's likely to be the milking cows so they have a group of animals within the herd where there is quite a bit of infection and where a lot of animals uh, may still be infected so the gamma interferon test is used as i said earlier it will identify more infected animals but it also works at an earlier stage from the point of infection than the skin test so it'll work from about three tests three weeks after the animals get infected so uh, you'll have the, the the dairy cows in most cases in a dairy herd um, uh, blood tested then at that stage and there will probably be more reactors uh, at that stage as well so that's basically what's going to happen to you if your herd goes down with tb you mentioned that we're working with farmers in hotspots. You are identifying badger sets. We know badgers can be a reservoir for TB, as are other wildlife. What are the Department of Agriculture doing to reduce the risk of these wildlife populations to cattle in Ireland? Wildlife source, especially badgers, is uh, definitely one of the ways that uh, TB can be introduced into a farm. So if we think about the way TB can be introduced or stay in a farm, we're talking about introduction from wildlife, particularly badgers, introduction um, through purchased animals, um, infection uh, remaining in the herd through, through residual infection, animals that get through the skin test repeatedly that are infected from a previous breakdown, um, infection from indirect or direct contact with neighboring cattle, or you know, infection related to the handling, uh, housing, machinery slurry type of environment so as i said uh, tb is in, increasing in the dairy segment of the of the irish herd of course we know that that um, wildlife doesn't have a propensity from for one sector or another but controlling disease spread from wildlife is very important so uh, what do we do about that well we identify uh, badger sets and then at those badger sets, we will either remove badgers if they're associated with TB breakdowns uh, from that epidemiology visit, or if in a vaccination zone, we will vaccinate the, the badgers to protect herds in that neighborhood from having TB in the future. But you asked me about the hotspots, and in the hotspots, we will, would mostly be removing badgers. And in the last couple of years, we've doubled the number of badgers that we'll have captured uh, a, a proportion. About half of those will be, will be vaccinated rather than removed. So that's what the wildlife program is all about. Key to the wildlife program, and especially in terms of vaccination, is actually knowing where all the badger sets are. And this is where... Um, interaction with the farmers, especially when farmers um, group together and they organize uh, walking of their land at a certain time of year, especially from October to February, March now, is ideal time to be identifying badger paths uh, leading back to sets. And where uh, farmers have organized to help the department out, it's been a fantastic success. And it's pretty much helped to clear TB out of the, well, out of the, reduce it hugely from the Ivory Peninsula and also the cooperation around the Burren area has been very helpful in the last few years as well. So once we know where all the, where we know where most of the sets are, we then are either removing or vaccinating badgers. What are the telltale signs of a badger set on a farm? Okay, so this is one of the ways where farmers can take action to reduce the risk of TB in their herd. So you can take action across all those other um, areas that I was talking about, introducing TB from purchasing animals, residual TB from a previous breakdown. With regard to wildlife, um, it's key to, first of all, understanding, you know, what badger activity looks like. Now, we have a video on bovinetb.ie that people can have a look at. Uh, to see what badger activity looks like. Sets are found in hedgerows, uh, ring forts, uh, riverbanks, 
and good farming land has the capacity to hold uh, to hold badgers. Wherever you see good green land, there will be badger sets, and there'll be badger sets at roughly one to one and a half kilometers away from each other. At a badger set entrance, you'll see a large spoil heap. It's the telltale sign that it's a badger set. So badgers are capable of moving quite large stones. We met a group of farmers in County Louth there during the summer, and we went out to look at a badger set uh, with the farmers. And you know some of them were quite taken aback by the size of the stones badgers can move and the size of this spoil heap. They'll have good wide uh, openings, about 20, 25 centimeters wide. And those openings, um, if you sort of put a stick in and twiddle it around, those openings don't uh, narrow, whereas with a rabbit burrow, they get rapidly narrow, even if they're wide at the outset. You'll often find hay-like bedding uh, at a set entrance. And that's a definite sign, again, that it's a badger set, because badgers bring bedding, they bring grass into their sets, and they, you know, they, they change that regularly, their bedding. So you'll often see what looks like hay outside. So they'll root then in the pasture land surrounding those sets for about, they will, they'll range for over a kilometer, but they'll spend most of their time within 500 meters of the set. They'll overturn cow paths. It won't be like a scraping, like what crows do. It'll be more of a, they'll overturn the hard uh, uh, top of the cow pad. They'll form loads, loads of snuffle holes, which are small little pits, sort of conical shapes. Um, about 12 centimetres in diameter. You'll see those in the land. You'll see a lot of scraping of the, of the sod. And the paths are well worn. They're worn right down to the bottom because, because unlike a fox, which is sort of trotting through the, the grass, badgers are very close to the, to the ground and, and they'll wear it down well. It'll be about 15 to 20 centimetres in width. Our message is stop, stop, tell. So stop. Uh, badgers getting to where cattle are. So we're talking about drinking troughs, we're talking about feeding troughs in fields, and we're talking about the yard. So yards can be made difficult for badgers to get into. Gates can have um, skirting put on the bottom of them. Some farmers put up a sort of a chain link fence. Others put a few strands of electric wire close to the ground. They keep their feed indoors as best they can. Um, badgers love um, uh, maize silage, they love sugar beet, these sort of things. They can contam contaminate these, feel, these feeds, so stop badgers getting to cattle. The other stop is stop cattle getting to badgers. So put a bit of electric fence around the set or around those latrines to stop cattle getting to badgers. And then the third part of our message is tell. Tell us about badger activity. And we have an app coming out later this year that you'll be able to, not later this year, later this month, that you'll be able to get uh, on bovinetv.ie. You go in there, you get the app, and then you're able to just uh, pop a little, um, uh, a little um, flag on, on where you see the, saw the badger activity on your farm and press go. And that, uh, that comes to us. You'll, you'll have given us your your mobile number, we'll give you a ring and we'll go out, see if it is a badger set. And if it is, put it up on our wildlife unit software. So that's how badgers can reduce risk around spread from wildlife. Of course, the risk can be reduced too around spread from purchasing in animals by, you know, inquiring what the uh, herd categorization of the herd that they're coming from is or, um, uh, are ensuring that they're buying animals that have had a recent TB test. Um, reducing the risk around residual infection or infection being left behind in animals in your herd can be done by keeping your herd young, basically. Uh, culling any cattle which were present that in a previous breakdown in your herd. Any animal that's been around at the time of a breakdown is at a higher risk for being a reactor in the future. So if you've had a if you've had a, a TB breakdown nine or 10 years ago, I highly advise people to, uh, to remove any of those animals uh, from their herds. This is a really interesting point you make, Philip, but I would question how practical it is from a dairy farm perspective. For one thing, the majority of dairy farms aren't closed because they are bringing in bulls for you know mopping up at the end of a breeding season. So by definition, they're not closed herds. A follow-on comment, you talk about keeping a herd young 
where there has been incidents of TB. This contradicts, you know, all of the efforts that we consider in terms of achieving high fertility rates, um, a mature herd with higher productivity, profitability and a lower environmental footprint. Well, in relation to the bulls, uh, Emma Louise, um, bulls are a risk because they do get around a full herd. Um, there was there was one pedigree breeder in the country uh, in the last year just decided uh, when he had a, a, a TB breakdown to, to castrate all his all his uh, bulls rather than than sell them because he was he was worried about what it might mean for for um, the name of his herd in the future. So bull, bulls are a risk, Emma Louise. It's not a closed herd if they're bringing them in. Um, the fact of the matter is that once an animal has been in a TB breakdown, it is at a higher risk in the future. And everybody will have to tailor how they address these risks for their own herds. But definitely, um, if you have animals that have been in a TB breakdown, well, then that's different to the 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 normal um, um, uh, policy that you've just spoken about there, where you want to have you may want to have an older herd for sustainability reasons. But if there's a TB um, residual issue in your herd, well, then really you should look at turning over all the animals and when i mean turning over culling all the animals that were present at that breakdown at some stage that is practicable for you on your herd but what i would advise people to do is that when you're exiting a tb breakdown to start thinking about what the replacement policy will be for the next four or five or six years that you will have rooted all the animals out of your herd over that time period that have been exposed to tb because that is a real risk to your herd, to your income and to your livelihood going forward. And for clarification purposes, where you just see the TB positive cases within the milking herd, are you also looking at turnover in the younger herd or are you just talking about the milking cows? Well, the research, uh, Emma Louise, is that animals that are present during a TB breakdown, of course, the research doesn't get down to that granular level of where they were within the farm itself. So, you know, there are going to be different levels of risk within those animals. Um, if you have um, um, dairy replacement heifers that had absolutely no contact with the cows and were perhaps on a different grazing platform, as they will be in a lot of dairy herds, well, then, you know, maybe they are, well, they are a lower risk than the animals that were actually housed and grazing with uh, reactors uh, day in, day out during the, the period of the, of the infection. So the, the broad based uh, advice, uh, Emma Louise, is to, you know, turn over all the herd within a time period that is practicable for you. But, you know, just you, you, you've mentioned that there may be different uh, levels of risk within the herd so then I suppose it's advisable to tackle the highest levels of risk the lower the lower hanging fruit as it were so the 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 cows that were maybe if there was a particular uh, problem in three three-year-old cows because they get infected as heifers or something like that they'd be the ones to get to to cull first and then to move to the lower risk animals as time goes on and to come back to an earlier point you talk about vaccinating badgers why not vaccinate the cattle population? Uh, it's something that could be a possibility in the future, Emma Louise. Currently, uh, it is not compatible with EU law to vaccinate uh, cattle uh, against TB. Why is that? Well, once you vaccinate an animal against TB, you can't actually do a diagnostic test on it anymore because the vaccination will, will uh, confound the test. So you can't test for disease anymore once you vaccinate. So you won't know if you have what level of underlying disease is there. So what is the trick? The trick is to be able to have a test that can differentiate between a vaccinated animal and an infected animal. And we here in, in, um, in Ireland, both in the, in, um, the, res the research side in the in third level, and also us in the Department of Agriculture, are cooperating you know, with British research efforts to try to develop these tests. They're called DIVA tests. So 
it, it's basically differentiating between infected and vaccinated animals in a test. And the, uh, the British researchers behind this are, are, that we're collaborating with are hopeful that a test of this type may be deployable in about five years time. If it were, well, then it is possible that, you know, the, the, the EU Commission and the, the rules around this would then be able to respond to there actually being a, a, a product available out there that would allow animals to become vaccinated because it would make sense, but it can only make sense when you can tell which animals are infected and which animals are vaccinated. Previously, we would have spoken with a colleague of yours, Michael Horn, and he would have talked about exporting, you know, this high proportion of milk and meat product out of the country. And the fact that we need to have healthy herds and, you know, a passport that would demonstrate that the product is safe and and free of illness. Is TB factored into these passports? Is it something that may prevent us exporting product from the country? And I guess as a follow on, is TB an, a disease that we can eradicate from the country in the future? TB is, is already restricting the sale of products internationally. So, for example, um, no beef can go into the Chinese market unless it has come from a herd which hasn't had a T- TB breakdown in the last 12 months. And of course, you know, there would be concerns uh, about around TB uh, associated with a, with a lot of different uh, other, other products, um, um, dairy-based products. So it's already affecting trade and it has the potential uh, if as more third country markets are opened up to affect trade in the future. Um, we know what the rules are within the EU, but we have to develop new rules each time we find a new trading partner. And of course, the buyer is always able to change those rules when they need to or want to. So it does affect trade. So you asked, um, what is the likelihood for TB eradication in the future? Well, TB eradication with all the underlying risks that we have in Ireland uh, up to a couple of years ago um, wasn't Uh, it was going to be a a very difficult prize. But I think TB eradication can be achieved. First of all, the vaccination of badgers is reducing, as those badgers get a higher population penetration, it's reducing the level of TB in those badger populations on an ongoing basis. And that's about protecting herds from infection from wildlife in the future. And we're still, of course, removing badgers at the moment in response. But... We have a TB strategy that was agreed with the stakeholders and all the farmers are around that table as well, which is uh, nearing completion of implementation. Most parts of it are being implemented, are close to to being implemented. That was uh, that was introduced in January of this year. That didn't tackle all the issues that need to be tackled in order to eradicate TB. Um, Again, using the term I used earlier, maybe some of the lower hanging fruit. But um, definitely, if we take the decisions to reduce the risk from cattle movements, from residual infection and from spread from wildlife and getting a really good quality test done, if we tackle all those uh, issues, we can achieve TB eradication. There's no doubt about it. It's been done elsewhere. It can be done here. This has been a really interesting conversation, Philip. And I think some of the points that you make are really, really interesting in terms of identifying, you know, wildlife that may be leading to TB outbreaks on farms and also then biosecurity and hygiene measures on the farm, being conscious of animals that may have been exposed to TB and, you know, considering where they fit within the herd. And also the final point, taking a look at the external barriers between your farm and other farms, such as fencing, is it sufficient to eliminate and reduce, mitigate the risk of TB to the firm. Thank you, Philip. That's great, Emma Louise. Thank you very much. That's it for this week's episode of the Dairy Edge podcast. And my thanks to Philip Breslin for joining me on this week's show. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Emma Louise Coffey and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.